good evening uh, ladies and gentlemen welcome to the first public lecture organized by the civil engineering sectional committee of iesl we have selected a very interesting topic today etihad indo stadium in melbourne this is the i believe this is the one and only indo stadium in the world i guess largest the largest uh various games are played in this especially cricket and i had the opportunity to have a look at this in australia so i thought it's worthwhile discussing about it the presenter today is dr saman de silva a program director master of engineering structures and forensic senior lecturer structures uh, RMIT University in Melbourne. Dr. De Silva uh, graduated from Mor uh, University of Morocco in 1982, and he has joined uh, after graduation CECB, and he has worked in uh, Mahavali projects like Madroya, Rambenigala, and Samanalavava before migrating to Australia in 1990. uh uh dr de silva obtained his doctorate from the university of melbourne specializing in structures he is a specialist civil structural engineering consultant senior academic and researcher in career spanning over three decades dr de silva is currently the program director of uh, master of structures and forensic engineering degree and a senior lecturer at uh, school of civil environmental and chemical engineering rmit university in melbourne so so it's going to be interesting one for especially the structural engineers as well as others as well so i would like to invite dr de silva to the podium to start his presentation is all yours Thank you, Prabodha, for that kind introduction. Um, good to hear a few uh, people I already um, knew and also worked with, and with some colleagues. Um, I initially thought of uh, focusing on structural aspects of this particular, this magnificent um, stadium, um, and then take you through the from the conceptual development stage up to the completion. and in subsequent use of this facility one of its kind particularly at the time of design um this uh, venue is considered as the largest um indoor outdoor stadium which has a retractable roof which can be closed and open the roof can be closed within 8 minutes of a storm advancing uh, towards the uh, venue So this is this type of projects only comes once in a life um and the opportunity to work in that uh, has been uh, probably I'll put on the top shelf of my experience um throughout the career it was challenging it was unusual and then more than anything that the entire design team was uh, has not done uh, a similar project before so we all were learning by doing it but of course we had enough experience in structures however the challenges and the variability and the uh in a way to aspects of the project put all of us uh and a lot of pressure but we have learned very quickly before i progress i wish to acknowledge the um team um who put this stadium together um there was a practice at that time established where uh, when a client want an iconic structure to uh, be built uh, one of the things um australians do well is calling for expression of interest which becomes a competition of course and then usually the structural engineer architect and the builder come together at no cost to the client would provide a proposal 
Um, so if you're a client, just imagine that you want only one stadium, but there are about 10 shortlisted projects in front of you at no cost. And then um, as a client, you will pick uh, the best you think. Of course, it was by the time of that competition, it would be conceptual, uh, preliminary estimations, and then uh, not a lot of development done at that point. This is just an expression of interest. This is the same criteria which most of the um, Olympic stadiums are being put around the world these days. So um, it is the same practice we had. The architect was Daryl Jackson Architects, Melbourne, Australia. Engineer Colonel Wagner, which I belonged to at that time of the design. Um, this was my last job before I became an acad career academic. Uh, and then I was stuck in the classrooms uh, since. Uh, Colonel Wagner, Melbourne, Australia. Of course, we have a sister organization in UK, which is called Mod Modus Colonel Wagner. And then um, in qualifying ourselves for this particular job, uh, we were a bit lucky because Modus Colonel Wagner was at that time designing the Olympic Stadium in Sydney for 2000 Olympics. So that joint venture uh, helped winning this bid. The builder is one of the uh, largest contractors in Australia, Boulderstone Honeybrook, uh, uh, probably uh, one of the top two. One of the good things that this combination did to us, that we almost work in one single office. The architect, the builder, and the structural engineer. So the concepts and the ideas evolved together refined to suit the practicality and the buildability aspect of the project. And also, um, as the project evolves architecturally, um, it has evolved engineering-wise as well as uh, construction-wise. So that, that is an advantage in this type of combination of work. I'm not 100% sure in Sri Lanka this practice uh, is, is, is done. Um, this, the, there is a standard term we use now, national approach to design and development, which can cut down a lot of time. Uh, this stadium was to be built, designed and built within two years. We have started our work in 1998, and then we finished building in 2000. So it is two years uh, to get this thing uh, designed and complete, constructed. So my, uh, the outline of my introduction, uh, broadly, uh, I'll in introduce you to the venue and the f uh, innovative features. And then I thought that I might spend a little bit more time on the roof design aspect and the detailing because that was the challenging part of the project. The rest of the, <coughs> excuse me, rest of the um, project was pretty standard reinforced concrete design uh, component. Usually, if you want to look at a stadium, I think it is very good to look at a stadium as a, as a, a two parts, which is seating bowl, um, where the people sit, and then, of course, the lid on top of it, which is the roof. If it is closing and opening, it is a closed, uh, complete lid. And then if you visualize a stadium in that sense, a large seating bowl, and then a cap, and then you can understand the concepts accordingly. Um, so I will just touch base, talk about seating ball and the pitch area, and then the design and uh, design for constructability comes into play when you design a large project like this. You will be manufactured or fabricated segments of the elements and then brought to site and assembled on site. When you are doing that, there are lots of unaccounted construction specific loading conditions do occur. And then most of the time, the structural engineer has not looked at it. Therefore, there's another refinement needs to be done to make sure that the construction loads does not exceed the in-service loads so that the structure is safe. So that's the uh, journey I'm going to take you through. Um, I have a lot of information, but I'll have to work within a 40 minutes sort of time frame. Um, and then I'll be rushing at some and then dwell a little bit more on the others. First of all, this, was, this didn't come as a 
um, isolated project in Melbourne. There was a part about three kilometers away from Melbourne CBD, which had about 3,900 population density at that time, which is very, very small. Uh, that was the dockyards area, docklands area. We have wharfs and the storage areas and the industrial zones um, only available. So there was a master plan development came, which took about 16 years at the cost of about $9 billion uh, to uh, get this wattage uh, area fully developed. As part of this proposal uh, was this stadium. Um, the the um, youth football uh, soccer finals a championship was to be played in Melbourne at that time. One of the driving factors for us to do it at a very short period of time. So 1996, the master development uh, proposal came together. This is around 1999, already, already this one has started. As, as I said, 1998, probably we have started um, the um, discussion and the design aspect of it. If you go to uh, Melbourne, uh, this will be one of the very beautiful areas to uh, visit and have a look. A um, lot of development has happened since. If you look at the stadium, uh, the one on the top um, is a stadium in its open uh, condition and then at the below the picture shows it is closed um, situation. There are a lot of uh, very unique and new um, features built into the stadium, which you will not see in many other stadiums around. This was initially proposed for 55,000 uh, seat uh, stadium, which was in the brief, and then later it was uh, reduced to about 52,500. There's a little bit of history into that. Uh, we will talk about that. That compromise was made based on uh, a few other improvements as well. 2005, this is one of the uh, stadiums around the world where you can drive under the pitch of the um, under the pitch, which means entire grass area is built upon uh, the car park. Inversely, the, you duck under the pitch, and then you'll be having a car park underneath. 2,500 car spaces, so you can park the car, climb the stairs. You are inside the stadium. Um, in order to do that, entire pitch area, the soil on it, natural grass drainage scheme has to be supported by a reinforced concrete slab. Underneath, you will be having car parking space. The other feature, which is very innovative at that point, is that the reconfiguration of the pitch area. Now, if you want to play cricket, as Prabhu just said, this uh, stadium is supposed to uh, host many different sports and other events, because this will be a um, multi-purpose venue. For that reason, you'll be looking at a kind of an elliptical shape. It's a large ground. If you look at rugby or soccer, it will be rectangular pitch area you require. So this can be achieved by actually having a movable seating tiers. Lower seating tiers can be pulled inwards about 100, uh, about 11.5 meters either side in order to make it rectangular in shape. So that the um, visitors or the patrons can come very close to action um, rather than staying further away. We will be discussing that aspect a little bit um, as we go. I already said the world's largest retractable roof, which is about 165 meters by 100 meters, comes in two, two segments um, which we will discuss, like large plates. Each plate would be about one and a half times a rugby uh, playing field. If you visualize 40 meters up in the air, one and a half times long uh, rugby, entire rugby playing area, and then that is what you are visualizing in this particular situation. Movable roof can enclose the entire pitch area within eight minutes. <coughs> this is uh, then connected to smart technology, which measures the uh, moisture content improvements and the advancing um, uh, storms and then it can be either operated automatically triggered to close uh, as the storm advancing towards the venue. It is multi-purpose as I said. Uh, you can have musical shows which can 
um, you can have all sporting events, you can have um, entire universities coming and um, hiring this one for, for an example, convocations or graduation ceremonies, uh, and then various other functions um, this has been used. Opened in March 2000, it, at that time it was around $230 million. Today's value to be around 408 over $500 million equivalents. It is fully illuminated with tall light posts, without tall light posts. As you all know, if you look at MCG, without a roof, you can have very tall light posts so that the day-night matches can be played. If you have a closing roof, you don't have that luxury, so you have to make sure that the lighting is within this roof. So those are the main features. One of the biggest challenges in designing that one to determine what's the height of the roof. This based on um, how high a, a leather ball could be hit, for an example, or how high a rugger ball could be kicked. Now, there are lots of literature on the pitch sizes of specific, uh, special any sport, but at the ground level. There were, at that time, there were no recorded uh, literature which tells us how high the clearance must be. So it was a real challenge. One of the first things that we had to do was to bring a couple of guys who can kick high, uh, highest uh, in the country and then ask them to kick and then use a um, distance measurement um, to try and see how high that they could hit. In an AFL a form of footy, there are guys who can uh, kick a ball as long as 100 meters and then as high as 60 meters. So you should be able to really, really find out how high the roof must go and then which point that it has to be the highest. So that area is not come under the purview of the structural engineering team, but definitely under the architects. Now you have to visualize, therefore, just think of, of one individual spectator and then draw a line of sight which can traverse through the periphery of the pitch area and then lift it up to the highest point where a ball could be kicked or hit and then that will determine the volume that person has to see, that individual has to see. And then just imagine that individual is cloned around the field at every tier, 360 degrees. That is representing each spectator who sits on that particular seat. And then that forms a large volume within which you cannot have any structural elements whatsoever to make sure that everybody gets a value for their money. So that is the challenge that is presented. Our stadiums are pretty repetitive in nature, uh, very easy to build, mind you. There are only few uh, stadiums which build from scratch, completely enclosing the area. Now, most of the pitches, uh, venues here, they first put a pavilion and then extend that further and further. But in this particular case, we had to build it in one go. Now, if you look at the repetitiveness, uh, which is structural engineer's dream. When you design one component, you can clone it and then keep it going. So if you look at each of these wedge type areas, there are 48 such uh, seating bays flanked by two easels. And then if you find a structural solution to one of those bays and then map it or copy it around the entire stadium, then you got the job done. So design-wise, structural design-wise, it's very repetitive. It's like a 100-story building where each floor looks exactly the same. So you design one, and then you map it up. Dream of a structural engineer. But this is exactly that scenario here. Give or take. There are a few changes. But it's also important for you all to um, um, try and uh, identify these gate areas, which we need uh, some knowledge. Um, these are the four main gate areas. And then just imagine that this area will have stairwells, lift shafts, and things like that, providing a very strong supporting uh, element, very similar to the core of a tall building, for an example. So these are, this got to be used very effectively in the structural scheme of things. So three things that we have to recognize here, that is it's very repetitive, 
this ridge is uh, the, the longest span would be roughly here, which would be about 15 meters. Uh, at the lowest point, it would be about 10 meters, 8 meters to 10 meters. Its length would be about 35 meters. And then therefore, if you can get one of these frames sorted out, and then it is just mapping all around. And then you got the job done. As far as the seating ball is concerned, and then you have to look into the lid or the roof, which I said, uh, which, which, is, which gives a completely different set of uh, challenges. We are not too far talking about multi-layered, multi-tiered um, stadiums in the world. I think there will be a time very soon, there will be MCG, there will be Etihad Stadium on it, and there's another stadium on it, like a multi-story building where different sports can be placed, transport hubs will be close enough, people know where to go exactly, at least around the same area. It, it will not be too far uh, behind uh, the way current things are going. Because the land values are getting very, very high, particularly in developed cities, and then therefore there's no other way of putting extra space for the venues other than stacking them on one another. And that is the future, hopefully. So movable seats, um, you can see that not, you can see that this part will be, when you are playing cricket, will be part somewhere up there, like this part here. This is a part position, and the minute is, this is a foot soccer match, it will be pushed this way, and then it will be pushed right very close to the outline either side. So these tiers, lowermost tiers, are movable. There are 11.5 meter trusses which are just uh, can be pulled out and then pushed back all mechanically though. And then the, the seating uh, tiers will be brought close to the playing area and then brought back to suit the different configuration. But the design itself um, became very interesting because of that aspect. Roughly speaking, you're looking at a it's about 240 meters long, 220 meters wide. This entire. So you will be finding when I'm uh, discussing about the roof con uh, concepts. Please remember that there will be a fixed roof area here, fixed roof area there. This is north, this is south, this is east, and this is west. East and west, underneath these flat plates, you will be having another fixed section of roof. That leaves us a rectangle shape, which is 100 meters by 165 meters. And then these two <coughs> plates or wings, which, are, which is 165 meters by 50 meters each, they'll start moving towards the center line of the um, stadium completely providing cover. This is the plate which I said, which is, is kind of at the size of one and a half times the rugby field, each one of them. And then this will, each one of them will weigh about 12,000, sorry, 1,200 tons. The total weight of the steel uh, structure which we have used here would be about 18,000 tons of steel required to get this project done. If you look it appears very, very slick design. Um, the members looks very um, finely optimized, but they are very large sections, by the way. This is the outside, of course. There will be a very good um, transport hub here. Um, used to call it Spencer Street Station. Now it's called the Southern Cross Station, and then where a large number of people can come. The most important thing for architects is that 55,000 people should get in. 55,000 people should get out at, at the peak. And then this circulation, which means the people's circulation, uh, has to be taken care of very seriously in situation. This is enclosed. The fire situations can become a little bit uh, of a concern. Uh, open pitches, open to air pitches, the fire is never a criteria. So uh, fire situations, what would happen is interesting as well. You can see that the gateways uh, have uh, large building type entrance and then there will be lift shafts and the uh, stairwells coming in these four corners 
which we will be using quite comprehensively to support the roof. So the structure aspect, when I explain, uh, you will see that. Inside the uh, building, I don't know whether how the resolution of this picture, but you will be seeing the outside. These are inverted trusses, and then the two flat plates will be traveling on this bridge-like arrangement, um, which we'll come to in a minute. And then these are the inverted trusses of the two panels. And then I suggested that these four corners, where these large TV screens are, uh, where the staircases, stairs, and the core shafts are located. So all this roof is predominantly supported by those four corners, which we will see uh, in a minute. This is the end product. Uh, you'll, be f uh, you'll find this funny set of a goal here, that is what you call AFL. If you hit through these outside things, you will score only one. If you hit through mid, then you'll score six. You may not have heard it, but this is, uh, that is a funny game, which is a cross between rugby and soccer, and in many other um, different games, I suppose. So you can also see this ridge looking uh, segments of seating uh, base and then which can be cloned, as I said, around the uh, stadium. There are three um, seating tiers. The lower one can be moved in and out. The middle one and the upper one stays uh, where it is. A typical cross-section to explain the entire structure, uh, the cross-section through north and east, uh, north and south roofs are slightly different, but predominantly the the structure, seating ball, is very similar. Only the roof trusses are slightly different. Why I said that I will not be spending too much time here, a uh, majority of you all have seen enough reinforced concrete buildings. This is nothing but a, uh, a sort of truncated building. If I were to build a complete building up here, you would be doing it very easily. Two bays or three bays at most, different flow heights, of course, and then the beams are going that way. So in any stadium, you will be having a very simple building right up there. What we do, and then we chamfer it there, and then cut it there, and then you've got your building. So this part is mainly reinforced concrete, and then it is very uh, standard reinforced concrete design you must have seen day in, day out. So I'll not spend too much time on it. This is that truss, that the seating tier, which can be moved towards the pitch. You can see there's a, there's a dark black line here, which provides the, which is like a railing system on which this truss travels. You can see folded platform kind of thing here behind that person. And then we, as, as this truss moves on, this becomes the platform so that you can walk along that and then get down to the tiers. And this distance is around 12 to 15 meters depending on where you look at. So that is the part. You can see here that the entire pitch is built over the car park. So this is where the cars are parked, 2,500 cars. And this entire pitch is built on a suspended slab, pre-car slab, pre-stress slab, sorry, which has about 600 millimeters of soil, entire drainage system, natural grass, and then so forth. So that is how the structure is built. Uh, this part of uh, it will be um, slightly uh, explain in time to come. So in, in short, so you'll be having this element, which I will spend a little bit more time on, which is the roof. And then the next part is the seating bowl, which we all used to. This is a simple reinforced concrete frame. All around it's identical, yeah, so you can clone it right around. The lower part is the underground car park area. Now this is uh, simply the product. Um, one of the things this consortium did very well at the beginning was to get a kind of, uh, when you are doing the roof design, kind of agree on a, a specific value system by which that all abound. We wanted it to look iconic. It should be buildable within the locally available labor. It should be time efficient. It should be quickly built. And the other one is the low risk. So high-end uh, proposals were uh, ruled out. 
So you can see that engineering wise, what you see there is a pretty standard um, design. But this is not the only proposal we made in order to design the roof. We looked at quite a number of different alternatives, which I will discuss in architecture and structural concept development se section. I'll talk about very quickly design criteria, loads, and spe special considerations. And then I would also um, uh, look at the detailing aspect of it. And then if time permits, a constructability aspect as well. One of the most interesting and intriguing design concepts we looked at to close that particular uh, opening. Although it is the final end product was rectangular opening, it doesn't have need to be rectangular opening. It was initially a circular or elliptical opening um, proposed. If that were to be the case, we looked at biomimicking, which the architects and the structural engineers are very fond of doing, looking at the nature and then bringing an idea. Bed swing is a fantastic uh, mechanism which you can uh, see. <coughs> You have two major bones, as, as, as you see in that part, two major bones, which is very similar to a, a foldable boom uh, crane. You may have seen the cranes which can fold its boom, and then it can be part at the back and then go. It is not a telescopic one, but it is the foldable one. If I am to get you to that idea again, it could be like a jaws of a crab, for an example. It can be folded and it can be opened. And then these are five fingers. Which, uh, which holds um, the wing. And then this could be used with fabric as if we would be using a simple umbrella. But you can't put a large post at the middle of the ground, but you have to work from sideways. If you work from two halves, you should be able to do it. So structural engineers usually look at a small thing and then take the inspiration and then build it big. This was the most exciting uh, proposal of all, and then we all wanted to jump at it. But then if you look at the iconic nature, no dramas, you'll be t getting a tick for that. If you look at the time, and if you look at the expertise required, and if you look at the risk, because it has never been done in the world anywhere, so you don't, you don't have a benchmark whatsoever, and then that will be a little bit frisky path. But we will not uh, discard that, and I wanted to share that with you. The second most possible, I think that's one uh, recent uh, stadium actually adopted this particular technique, which we have looked at. It is the NSLR camera with an aperture where a number of sliding plates close and opens uh, the aperture. Now you can use this one for circular opening above a large uh, stadium. So all what you have to design is mechanically drawn half circles, circular parts which will eventually turn and then close it and then open it. It's exactly the mechanism which we have used in a camera which we were to use. That was feasible. That is engineering wise quite possible to do. And then humble Chinese fans provides enormous amount of inspiration in this case. You can use a set of trusses or large plates pivoted at one point, which will open and close mechanically, which will be sewn with a fabric or folded plates, and then it will open and then close as, as you wish. There are different varieties of it, mind you. Rather than having a fa fabric or a folded one, each one of these things can be plates. Kind of cross between the aperture aspect and this one. So each one of them can come together and then open up as plates. The other one is, of course, there are two ends. It can go completely one round. Just imagine that you have a large truss here or a large truss there. It can travel 360 degrees and come back there. And then that will be open. And then if you come that way, it will close. And then just use this periphery of the seating ball where a bogey or a small mechan uh, roller, mechanized roller, can open it up and then close it. Up. So that's a simple technique. So these were the three uh, inspiring ideas which we thought of using initially, but later decided that we'll go with the uh, end product, obviously. This is based on a simple shiploader technology which was available, tested, known, um, which is very simple. This is nothing uh, fancy about this idea. If you, we can visualize a two, uh, the, the sliding door when you 
enter your offices. It slides in and out. You look at it and then put it horizontal plane, and then this is exactly it. There's nothing special. Only thing is you had to build it at a larger scale. So the, it is almost a horizontal sliding uh, dough, nothing but that. So we stuck with this particular idea, and then that has given lots of other strengths to us, and then we go on by, we, we have gone with it. I'm pretty sure very soon that other options will be taken into consideration in future stadiums. I don't want to recite too much on this one. Very quickly, as anyone would do in this situation, we looked at the gravity loads, wind loads. Unfortunately, the AS 1170, which is Australian wind code, was not sufficient to deal with the project of this nature because these values are given for a small uh, empirical data and ac accumulated data. We had to do a wind tunnel test for two reasons. One is to identify how the wind pressure is acting on the uh, roof, and the second one is what the impact. <coughs> this particular stadium would put, put on the surrounding buildings because by just putting this structure there, it is going to completely change the wind uh, turbulence profiles within that region. And then it is the responsibility, the, the you know, look at it. Similarly, uh, in the subsequent developments, all the buildings which put around this area has to do the wind and tunnel testing and to ensure that the, the wind pressures are not going to be worsened on this structure. So there's a shared social responsibility that uh, the designers must do. Of course, this has to be taken care of by earthquake loads need to be looked at, which we, which we considered. There were some dynamic uh, uh, response analysis has to be done, which I will discuss in a minute. Um, thermal loads, uh, there's a 40 degree, if you give this structure, this steel trusses, which are 120, 150 meters, 165 meters, and 120 meters long, a 30 degree temperature difference. If you restrain that, it will buckle uh, like uh, simple strings. So you have to look at the thermal aspect of it. You had to put one, one end on support and the other end on the roller. Uh, but even you, if you put the roller, then it will, it will deflect so much. So you have to find an answer in between. It's a very interesting real engineering problem uh, to deal with. So you have to have the bearings purpose designed to take part of that restraint, but leave part of the expansion <coughs> possible. Um, thermal loads, uh, material codes are pretty standard. It's 3600 uh, refers to B8810 here, or your code, which is a concrete design code, and is 4100 is our steel design code in Australia, but I'm pretty sure that uh, this would be standard. Connections are the only comprehensive document available for hollow section connection designs is the SIDECT design guide. Even that was insufficient at the time. We had to couple that guidelines with finite element analysis of most of the connections uh, which, which, which are presented. Design for construction loads is another one which I will probably uh, be able to uh, talk to you during um, the rest of the presentation. So that is for the completion of completeness of it, I, I put that. Um, structural analysis and design tools, we have used space gas. I don't want to uh, necessarily promote the um, trademark, trade name here. This is just, just uh, which I call a discrete element analysis software package, which considers each element uh, having two nodes and um, six degrees of freedom at each end, and then the member length so far, which is perfectly okay for the roof uh, design for us. Um, and then uh, static and dynamic analysis feasible in this particular software. Of course, ACAD is pretty standard. Uh, and the other advantage is ACAD files can be transported directly as DXA files to space gas and vice versa. Strand 6 is the FEA analysis package which we have used. Uh, it doesn't matter which analysis, uh, FEA analysis you use, it will do the job for you. The RAP is a specialized reinforced concrete and pre stress design analysis and design tool available. It's, it's, it's uh, developed in Australia and widely used in most of the structural engineering companies. So RAP is um, used for most of the reinforced concrete segments that we have discussed. 
I mean, there were numerous in-house design tools which we developed, the company itself developed, which, uh, which we used. For example, we have developed a spreadsheet using the SIDEC uh, guidelines, uh, which we comprehensively use for connection designs in this one. So this is basically the structural model. Uh, in 1998 standards, the most powerful desktop computer would take 12 hours to analyze this. We had about 128 odd loading combinations, different loading combinations. Uh, if I press the button uh, in the morning, it will keep on analyzing. I have nothing else to do during daytime. So what I have to do, make sure everything is taken on board. And then just before I go home, I press the button and it will keep on analyzing during nighttime. I'll have some results in the following morning. So there's a large number of, a uh, lot of time required at that time. Now this can be done within an hour or less than that. I'd like to explain this roof uh, in two segments. This is which we call the east and west uh, st fixed roof. The two panels are part above it, which is not shown for clarity. And this is north, this is south. These are north and south fixed roof sections, which we do. I'm pretty sure that majority of you will be able to visualize if you're a structural engineer how it works. Point A, B, C, and D are the strong supporting points, which I mentioned, provided by the lift shafts and the stairwells. If we take 50, 52,000 people, say 55,000 people, uh, or say 50,000 people, the four gates are supposed to accommodate 12,500 people moving in and out. So we have a large number of lifts. We have large, uh, relatively big uh, stairwells because in a fire situation, you are not supposed to use the lifts. So we have enough guts, enough members, structural members to uh, stick in there so that it can support all these members. So basically, this entire design is made out of T some and then few secondary trusses. Primary trusses T2, T3, T7, and T6, which you can't see, which was on the plates. Um, T5 is what I call a span road truss, which goes right around the stadium, which is like a tie beam, tie member of a building. And then sometimes it comes under tension, sometimes it comes under compression, depending on whether uplift forces or downward push. So um, that is what it meant for. These two bridge-like uh, trusses, which have been supported by this large truss T3, so T7 and T3 works together. And then th uh, there are two rails on this where the large plate starts to move this way. And the other, the parking position would be here. And then when the storm comes, it moves that way as well. So these are um, large trusses on which that we have two rails, like a a rail carriage and then it keeps on moving. This is that A, B, C, D sort of uh, strong positions. This is where the uh, supporting points are. This particular line indicates roughly the amount of space we had uh, to work with uh, in order to get the structural scheme going. I will skip this one so you will roughly understand C and D points are there, T3 is here, T6 is there, this is T7, um, this is the finished product and then this, this particular plate will be traveling right up on that one until the midpoint somewhere up here. This is a, just a detail of the uh, north and south uh, plate, there's a large truss. This truss is about 14 meters which is very close to five-story building height, height of five-story building. The top codes and bottom codes are very large, which is 610 millimeter diameter hollow sections, which are not available in structural applications anywhere. Uh, BHP is one of the biggest steel manufacturing groups in the world. Um, they were, at that time, they were only producing up to 300 millimeter circular hollow sections with wall thicknesses as big as 12. These top and bottom codes are 610 millimeter diameter, 
with 58 millimeter wall thickness. So you can imagine, each one of these members will take about 30,000 kilonewtons as axial tension and axial compression, the bottom code and top code. So these are huge trusses by any stretch of imagination. This one is spanning about 120 meters. Um, this is 120 meters. Uh, each, each bay is about 7.5 meters. These segments, they are not curved, they are straight between the node points. But overall, it looks like a curve. Okay, they are straight lines. And then on this particular structure, there's another little uh, truss, there's another little attachment, which is truss number T7, on which that the plates are moving. So the rails are there. This is like a cobble. This is like a cobble of a normal gantry structure, nothing else. But you can visualize how it works together. This is a simply supported truss between two ends of C A and D, I think, um, where, the, where the, the core and the stairwell is. And then these are the secondary trusses which are coming from the uh, periphery towards the be supplied here. There will be a moment. That moment will be taken care of, but that torsional aspect can be taken, counterbalanced by the backspan of the secondary trusses, if you visualize from as a structural engineer. So it is a very nice combination and extremely optimized solution. So this is what I am explaining here. This T7 comes and stitched onto that. This T7 is only spanning from 7.5 meters from one point to another. It is continuously support except the middle. So these segments are 3.75, which is half of 7.5. So there will be every other node, it will be supported by this large truss, which I said about 14 meters, which is about five stories, very close to five story. It's a diamond type truss, uh, which requires uh, for detailing and the cobalt effect. And then two rails will go here, and then the, there's a bogey which will run on this one as a rail track, um, or carriage would run on a rail track. This is some, these are some of the details. This is that T7 truss. This is, these are the two I section on which that this um, rail tracks are laid and then on which um, the uh, two bogies, <coughs> which is holding each plate, would start traveling. These are the secondary trusses. These secondary trusses are not small. They roughly go between 42.5 meters span to about 16 meters. You can see that there's a nice little curve. Because of that, this 42.5 to 16 meters uh, either way. East West Roof is very similar. It is extremely funny shaped truss normally. This is so optimized. If you look at really carefully, this bottom line, bottom coat is exactly following the bending moment diagram. So it is so optimized. And then the two ends becoming a little bit bigger, so you have a middle code as well, top code, bottom code, and two middle codes. And then beyond certain point that this will take care of the shear aspect of it. So if you uh, use a simple bending moment diagram for a simply supported member, you know there's parabolic, and then you, you know there's a, a triangular distribution of shear. Shear is taken care of by this part, and then this is following exactly the bending moment diagram. What it means is that this is highly optimized. I mean, in a normal sense, you could have done like that. But would I, that, that wouldn't have been a good solution because that will obstruct line of sight for many, many, many spectators right up there. So you have to really, really optimize these things. And you, you could see the fish-like uh, trusses going uh, perpendicular to that. And then these are, again, around 39 meters simply supported and then 15 meters cantilevered. One of the biggest problems we encountered was to get this line, a straight line, why is that? That is because the backspan varies all the time and then the cantilever part remains constant. So in this case, there's a lot of support from the backspan effect for this tip to dip down. But in these cases, you don't have that backspan effect. So to get this line to a straight line, perfect straight line, structurally impossible. Why? Because this is 15 meters, it's like a continuous beam that continuous part would be having a larger span, so it will be trying to kick the other tip skyward. This tip will be looking skyward, but this would be looking skyward, but this will not.
looking skyward that much. So that's the kind of challenges that you face. We had to devise a special turnbuckle arrangement for the bottom cord of these cantilever trusses. So once it is pre-cambered, put it in place, if it doesn't look right, there's a turnbuckle mechanism which can bring that tip to perfect line. So those, all those things are completely different analysis techniques and you have to even check the thread where they, where they can take the shear and the forces coming through that. So for, so, sorry? Manually. That has been, during the construction you, you have to fix it in place. Nine out of ten times the uh, uh, dead loads are covering, governing that one. The, most of the wind loads are in the, in the uh, is negligible in terms of the dead weight of the structure. So if you get it for the dead loads, including the sheetings, that stays put. It may go a few millimeters up or down during the wind situation, but it is hardly be visible. But for general purpose, but it is like a pre camber setting. But the pre camber was done in a cantilever, if you if you may look at it in that sense. We have only analyzed for dead load in that ca that case. Sensibility dead loads. Uh, this is that truss. This truss is this is the top code, these are the middle codes and this is like a like a prism like uh, diamond like shape. The interesting one is this 4.8. This truss is about 12 meters, which is about four story building height. But if you look at the entire stadium, you would not feel it that high. The truss will be spanning around 150 meters. The truss is 150 So these are the fish like um, trusses. Uh, there are quite a number span changes from 39 to 60. This part becomes smaller and smaller because it's curving. This is the middle one. And then this cantilever part stays put with about 15 to 16 meter sort of cantilever. It is 15.75 plus another 125 or so millimeters. Um, we have this uh, spandrel truss, which is a pretty standard truss, um, which is only two meters deep um, and sorry, 1.1 meter deep, um, and then it is spanning about 15 meter segments. These are the large two plates, which I said the size of one and a half rugby fields. Uh, there are two trusses, T6. These two trusses are being here. These are also very tall. This is, very, this is similar to 12 meters as well. And then this is the uh, plate, which is the moving plate, which comes together. And then if you go a little bit further, and then these ones are simple purlins or uh, parallel flange sections, which are part cantilevering from this truss, part cantilevering from there, simply supported between. This, this this plate is hung off these trusses. So this this roof plate is hung off these two trusses. These trusses are 165 meters long. As I said, uh, this is as I said 11.8 12 12.4 meters. So I said 12 meters roughly. Uh, it has very different profiles. Top is slightly different. Uh, bottom one is that, um, and then the front and the back profiles are given here. So mainly it is a simple truss, three-dimensional truss, uh, which is you can see at, at the bottom it is wider, at the top almost at the midpoint, top, two top codes are kissing each other, almost touching each other, so it's slightly different. This is one of the most difficult things we ever encountered, how to get this one constructed. You can't construct in, in up in the air, what we had to do was to uh, create a four gantries in the corner and um, which are about 168 meters apart about 26 meters wide and then we have fabricated that on ground and then we were lifting that and then putting on the rails of that large built type structure so it was built outside I'll be having a little picture to show this is how the bogey system works this is this is here um, have the um, little rail if you can see these are like rail um, wheels similar to a rail carriage and then this is the large truss so this travels in and out of the page on truss T7 which is supported by truss T3 here if, if, if I, I may say so this is a pretty uh, serious design and then we had to uh, get mechanical engineers involved in it. this one of the uh, biggest problems we encountered was that the derailment of this large plate what happens if a large wind comes 
in the resonance starts to come into play and then this goes as a sale and then it derails with a 55,000 there and then elite athletes playing. Now you can lock it but that is one thing and then if it you can't go it will come as together. So there's a significant um, dynamic analysis has to be performed to ensure that a that an advancing storm does not of the natural frequency of the assembly of the plates so that the resonance could happen at any given time. And if it does, it will be shaking about two times or three times magnitude magnified. If that is the case, there's no way that this particular thing can be hold in place. So derailing is a possibility. But we have looked at it and then dynamic analysis proven uh, beyond the safe range that the resonance may not occur. That's the dynamic aspect I just touched with. I'll skip these things. The other thing I think it is needless to say, the connection detailing uh, will become the most critical one. There's a lot of work has to be done. There are so many connections. Therefore, we have to find a rational method. With few number of drawings, we should be able to communicate to the contractor that this is what we want. So a lot of rationalization has done. And then we identify types A, B, C, and D. We give simple instructions and ensure every corner is covered through that. We had about six or seven different types of connections. But the complexity of the connection design, you can imagine the number of nodes, uh, the number of members running into each node. I'll quickly go through um, some construction aspects. Kind of this is that T2 truss, which I said the Benny Moment diagram, bottom code follows the Benny Moment diagram. This is 150 meters, therefore you cannot bring it in one piece. You, you brought it in five pieces of 30 meter segments, transported from who, uh, who was about 100 kilometers away from CBD in an area called Geelong. Now what has happened here is the in service situation, the entire uh, truss would flex like that. But the segment wise segment, and then you will be constructing temporary structures, large uh, towers to hold segments, those are spliced. So now the splice can has to be brought in and bolted together. Just imagine the entire truss will be going like a one scalp, one flexing parallel. But if you have segments, it will be going like bits and pieces. So if you look at each one, this part, edge of tip of that one looking skyward, because that's a deflection criteria. This one looking skyward. The gap would be about five millimeters. Now how can you bring this together? Up in there. 40 meters up on temporary structures, you had to pull them together and then align so that you can bolt it. So those type of, uh, and then the back span is half of that 30 meters. If I say this one is 3,000, uh, say for an example, 2,000 tons, each segment weighs, and then it's a lever arm we had to bring it back is few millimeters, whereas the back span is 50, 30 meters. So alignment is taken and it's a huge story there. I think time doesn't permit uh, going any further, but basically the construction related in this type of structures, you can happily design at office what you see in in-service condition. If it is constructed then full, but it never happens. Then the builder would come and say, hey, look, what's going on here? We cannot bring them in one piece. Two options, you, you fabricate it here and lift it there. It's impossible. Second, you bring it in parts, splice it, bring it in parts, and then stitch it on ground, on the, on the on side. That is what we have done, but it has given some challenges, which which overcame again through brilliance of engineering. These are pictures. Um, uh, things are coming. The roof is not yet there, but you can see the. Uh, uh, this is the seating tiers, one of the beams. This girder is about 1.8 meters to 2 meters wide, it's very large girders. And then uh, these seating tier beams or plates, we call them, uh, can span, as I said, if you look at that wedge, it is at that 10 meters, and then at the below, um, it comes to 15 meters. It, at the lower level, it comes to about 10 meters. So these spans could be anywhere between 15 to 10. So you can do it with about 600 to 700 deep uh, plate-like uh, beams, very narrow beams, which will form the seating tiers on the side. It is sort of pinned here, 
uh, and then very nicely situated. So this entire span, uh, there are no secondary beams in between. It is just the seating tier itself as precast element spans between the two girders, which are varying from 15 to 10 meters. This is partially uh, east-west roof is done. North roof is still under construction. You can see the other uh, the, the the plate is being constructed on site. Just about to lift through these towers. Uh, this will be lifted from Eden. It will be loaded slowly to this uh, this large bell type structure. And then when it is part, it will be sitting here. And then the other side will be sitting somewhere there. When it is closed, it will move towards the middle. This is halfway through. We are uh, uh, lifting it. Uh, we estimated there should be about 410 or something, uh, 480 millimeter middle sag uh, possible. We were, we were supposed to calculate it very accurately. Uh, it was monitored and measured as each lift goes. And then there's a, a problem uh, called um, rolling. Rolling is when you look at a large plate being lifted like that, there's a possibility of one end rolls against the other, no matter how accurate that you construct it. When you happen to that, you were estimating about 190 millimeters uh, or thereabout uh, roll uh, can happen. And when you, when you have that, uh, most can unstitch or come out. Uh, or detach. So we have to be very careful. If it's 190, we could tolerate it overall, um, which is the, the role is between the two ends of the tip. So in 50 meters, it is not much, but you have to be careful. Th those are very carefully monitored as it comes and unloaded to the uh, brakes. This is at the highest point, just about, and then these two uh, planes or towers would travel that way and then slowly load this one into this belt truss here. And then that was like a foray kind of a uh, position. When, when that was done, everybody seems to be comfortable. Up until that time, nobody knew what would be happening. Um, so and in short, it uh, gave enormous um, challenges, but it has uh, given us a 90 degree learning curve, which uh, we, can, we can carry for the rest of our lives. Most of the things I, I mentioned are off my head, basically, because that you, you, you embedded in yourself in this type of project, and that you, you can remember years after that. This was the first uh, ever cricket match ever played. Uh, I was there watching it. Um, Jayasure, uh, one of the sixes, got stuck in one of the trusses uh, because we could not. Uh, the bats were improving, the balls improving, um, the batsmen are improving. Um, therefore, you, the, the, the big at that time, I think T20 was not even uh, in play. Uh, if you get the T20 um, Indian League uh, guys uh, hitting here, I think there will be a big trouble. Um, and then the other thing is, I visit this uh, venue, which is very close to me every year. This is RMIT graduation ceremony. I come from a university has 65,000 students, 4,000 staff, and then 123 degree programs of it. Uh, so our convocation is all around here. Each faculty is here. So we hired this venue, and this is 2013 um, convocation or graduation ceremony. Thank you very much for uh, listening. I hope that I uh, add some value to your evening. Um, that concludes my uh, talk. I'm, I'm more than happy to answer any question um, you, may, you may have. I have one question. When you developed the concept of the roof, you said you have uh, thought about uh, three options, not four options. Bat, then camera, lens cover, and the Chinese fan. Yeah. And this uh, you uh, finally decided on cheap loader technology. Yes. So what are the reasons, what are the things you, that made you predict or? Risk, risk of completing that to be ready for 2000 uh, soccer games. Um, you, the, usually the architects can take you out of your comfort zone. Most of the times they do. 
but we need to be sure that we had Australian expertise to construct something like that. So the bat swing has never been tested anywhere, tried anywhere. Even if it was tried half the size of the stadium, we would have had a benchmarking aspect of it to look into that. But we didn't. So it was very up the cloud kind of an idea. One of the reasons we could argue, theoretically we could argue, there's no dramas with that. One of the very reasons why we have to go away with that is because um, there's a risk of uh, we finding trouble halfway through, which is, which is not engineering wise, not foolproof, not proven. Uh, to some extent. If uh, in, in future that you you have a, um, a, a enough uh, money, expertise and time, in fact, uh, I think the people will try things like this. Uh, that makes it really iconic in a sense. Um, I don't know whether you picked, uh, Prabhupada, we, we set a value system very earlier on uh, when the co-rational design team came together. We wanted a roof should be iconic, talked about, but at the same time, we don't want to take too much risk and the constructability become terribly hard. Tractor rules as well. So uh, I would say limited budget, as in many cases, good ideas take a risk when the budget, the time, and the construction expertise within your shows uh, becomes unavailable. That was the only reason. But, but the most preferred one was that bed swing. It's very light. Uh, it's never tried, uh, but that, that still the trusses has to span uh, about near 100 meters. Co-rational is that the architect's idea immediately tested by the engineer sitting almost together. In the cutting edge softwares nowadays, digital architecture softwares are linked through a parametric, what we call a parametric tools to a structural analysis tools. You don't have to wait until the architect finish his job, pass it on to the engineer and then analyze. As architecture draws his diagrams, it is being analyzed via uh, uh, through the cloud and then you could see the stresses and the strains and the deflections, and then you can immediately talk through that. Co-rational means once idea is improved together by each other. There's no point that you have a very sleek design, and then we ended up with putting lots of structural solutions. So the co-rational, if you do it properly, most of the co-rationally designed projects uh, are very sleek. Uh, structural scheme is nicely matching the theme of architecture. Uh, the best core rationale is that the engineer and the architect living inside you, if I may say so. There are some expert architects, engineers are in that. The second better core rationale is you have a fantastic colleague with whom you work all life and then you, you speak the same language, right? Uh, but reality is far from that. So therefore, um, the core rationale design is right, almost the ideal one. Uh, for an example, in this particular case, the builders immediately rejecting the um, idea of connection, oh, it's too hard or something like that, uh, made us quickly look at it. I'll give you a classic example. Um, normally, the bottom code of these trusses, uh, one of the things architects said, we don't want to see any ugly connections. So the bottom code, which is taking about 27,000 kilonewton tension, in a pipe which is about six, 610, but 34 millimeter volt thickness, and then we immediately designed very nice, you know, there's a flange in this place, another flange in this place, like gas pipes, and then put together and then put all the bolts, as many bolts as possible. This was rejected point blank. We don't want to see. It should be seamless. The um, connection splice. So what's the options available to you? If it is a compression uh, splice, we know how to do it, seamless, unseen. But tension, only way you can do it, for 27,000, take it, divide it by the tension of the biggest bowl that you can find. How many bowls would you require? So that's the bottom line. So you can't really find an answer. And then the answer would be to weld it. Grind it, weld it. So this is not a small job. 
This is a 610 millimeter diameter pipe with 58 millimeter thickness. If you want to put the butt weld, what would be the width of the top? 100, in, 100 millimeters, right? 50 milli 58 times 2, right? Now just imagine you welding this one, one after the other, one after the other. It will cook the surrounding material. We know in a weld parent material is much more stronger. Uh, the weld material is much more stronger than the parent material. But what we don't know is whether it impact the ductile, ductile properties of the steel. So this is a bottom line, a bottom code. Intention, no warnings whatsoever. If it gives in, it gives in. So the ductility is number one. We wanted to find out somebody who can certify, saying that you can have so many weld drums which will increase the temperature to extreme, which will not degrade the ductile properties of the parent material surrounding. We know the strength was okay, but we didn't know. Test it in the laboratory. There's no laboratory which in the world which can test a 610 millimeter uh, square uh, circular hollow section with 58 millimeter wall thickness. Nowhere. So how do you do that? Then we had to engage a metallurgist who would sign, discuss and sign and then share the responsibility that I think it is a reasonable judgment. That's how it went. That's a classic example of uh, architects wanting something and then all the team working together. Um, and then that was, uh, was one. There, there are quite a number of examples I can give you. The core rationale thing can bring those type of things to conclusion very quickly. Yes, it was an unpleasant request from our point of view, because this is how we do tension uh, splicing in, in uh, circular hollow sections everywhere. And then mind you, I have uh, forgotten to mention one. Uh, as I said that the circular hollow sections of 619 never been produced in Australia at the time. The highest one was around 300, something 390, very close to 400, not 600. Definitely not uh, wall thicknesses like 38 millimeters, 50 to 58 millimeters, 52 millimeters and so on. So when, when we wanted to source this material, we looked at three other industries, offshore structures, gas, gas supply lines, Okay, we found gas supply lines uh, this diameter and this wall thickness because these were pumped under enormous pressure. New certificates has to be obtained and then we have to uh, source it from USA. It takes six months for delivery from the order date. So if you got one wrong, the program can delay in the top code and bottom code especially. If you got the calculations wrong, the delay period would be six months to upgrade it. So there were, there were very unique challenges in that sense, which, which required to be sit down and then put all thoughts together. Having said that, most of these members, particularly the critical uh, or the primary trusses and the critical members of them, they are working in the 92 percentile capacity. So there's no hardly any fat in this particular structure. It was fully optimized. And even with that, I think the total weight would come to about 18,000 tons. How long did it take uh, to liquid from the entire stadium? Uh, capacity? Capacity? Sorry, I didn't, I didn't get that How question. How long did it take to liquid in case of an emergency? Right. Uh, the, uh, the emergencies can be, uh, I, uh, this, is, this comes under circulation aspect of it. Normally, the architects and the building service are the people who address this. I just want to qualify that before. So, in a fire situation, the people who are on the seating tiers can immediately brought into the middle of the ground. There's no combustion. I've seen in 1996 um, uh, semi-finals that the Indians set fire to one of the things and then the fire is not an issue here. However, if the fire is an issue in the building section, you know, the, the foyers and the kiosk areas behind the seating tiers, that has to be taken into consideration. And then I would, I would think in an emergency situation in that case, that you should be evacuating everybody in the middle of the ground, not the other way around, because that, that passage is very, very narrow. Everybody will run like mice through that sort of with a little thing in relative terms. Um, and the other thing that we also looked at, uh, uh, 
precedences of similar failures of fire um, uh, fire situations and so forth. It was hardly found any case studies which would support um, actually the stadiums have a have a large problem. There's another thing I didn't actually mention. There's another one major area of concern was that when you have a music show, music shows, particularly if people start dancing on the on the uh, sitting chairs, the footfall frequency can become very closely natural uh, for the natural frequency of the uh, sitting chairs, and then that can create such a vibration, not large, but such a vibration, the fatigue would kill it. <coughs> fatigue would bring down the structure. So that was looked into the dynamic, I said dynamic response, we looked at the uh, two closing and opening uh, plates. It yeah. was a concern to us in that case. I re remember doing some numbers, but it was completely uh, out of uh, this. Uh, at the same time, there was a very good report published by uh, Melbourne University. Um, they have experienced a, they had a Rolling Stone and Madonna um, two shows in uh, MCG, at, at, at MCG. And then um, they, I, uh, they first time felt some vibration, severe vibration, seating tears. And then that was then um, studied by, uh, it was, it has happened during Rolling Stone, which is a rock band. Everybody jumps up and down. But the Madonna is also the people who are dancing. So the, before the Madonna show, they had to do a study and then qualify that should be okay, fit enough. Uh, that is taken up by the council from memory. Uh, member, Melbourne City Council requires some sort of justification. And that report is the most comprehensive uh, report on uh, sitting tears, uh, sort of vibration in stadiums. Luckily, that was available to us by the time that we were designing that. That was completely a coincidence, though. Uh, that was never a, never never planned. So I remember um, that that uh, that one was very good. Uh, the uh, the large sections which we um, we brought from um, gas and fuel industry, um, they were around four hundred sixty off my head. Uh, the rest. Uh, Other, other elements, but the top code and bottom code, especially the important stuff from um, USA, I said, um, are, are much higher grade than uh, normal structural steel that we use. Uh, our, uh, our main question was the ductility aspect of it, because most of our design criteria uh, and design guidelines and the design codes uh, assumes all the ductility there. So um, that was the part which we wanted to be sure. How long does it take the Eight minutes. Eight minutes. Sure. No, yeah. Eight minutes means if you can calculate it. Uh, 50, 50 meters it has to travel. Because I said the opening is 100 meters. So 50 meters it has to travel. You have eight minutes. You can see it moving. Uh, but it's not going uh, at a high, high speed. Uh, one question regarding yeah. the pitch phase. Yeah. Um, you said there is uh, 600 millimeters of soil. Yes. And what about the drainage system? What kind of drainage system do you have and how? It's a drainage how system. The total yeah. Um, the, the 600, so before the soil is being laid, at the bottom of the reinforced concrete slab, you segmented areas, of course. There's an inverted beam like set arrangement and segmented. And then you will be having a lot of drainage pipes laid in at the bottom of that slab on the top, top of the uh, slab and then those will be like any other tank for example you know, in a small scale if you have a concrete slab uh, kind of a arrangement yeah and then you will be having pipes underneath uh, and then there's a filter a fi number of filters like in a retaining wall kind of situation starting with the large and the smallest at the top and then the filtering aspect comes into it <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's the main problem that uh, we have to account for was what we call the ponding possibility. If these pipes, so you have to have alternate parts as well, and if it gets blocked, and then if it, without seeing it, if it gets pond, the ponding starting to happen, and that could be a devastation. Uh, uh, we were not worried about leaking. If in an eventuality, if it leaks and um, get few cars. Uh, Sort of failure. If, if 
if 600 millimeters of water replaces the soil, for an example, uh, that could be uh, Usually, um, our grid, grid lights, depending on the grids, of course, we have uh, typically Australian, even in buildings, if you have a car park underneath, our building grid line is 8.4 meters by 8.4. That's one of the biggest conundrums when I went to Australia first. All the grid lines are 8.4. My question was why? Why it is not 8? Why it is not 9? Why it is 8.4? And then the answer was 8.4, you can park three cars. If it is less, you have only two and a half cars points. So that is the optimum parking space in terms of uh, Australian space. We will be, uh, we, uh, we are having pre-stress um, uh, beams and then we, uh, we will be having the slab. Uh, usually, I would say that the, uh, I didn't involve in that design, but I can um, uh, get from another similar project. We'll be looking at about 600 millimeter deep beams, and then Australia is using something very unusual, uh, uncommon in this part of the world. Band, what we call band beams. Uh, band beam is it is 2.4 meters wide, 600 millimeters deep, 2.4 meters wide. Band B B N D. The beam is like a middle band. Yeah. Just imagine that because it's eight point four form work and other things are also settled out for this. Most of the builders know what what, what it means. If you look at eight point four grillage, just imagine that you have a very wide beam, like a like a drop panel, <coughs> like like a shear head, like a drop panel if you wish visualize. It's two point five meters, so one point 2 meters this way, 1.2 meters this way, 2.4 .4 meters, 8.4 take away 2.4 meters is 6 meters of slab, yes, and then 6 meters of slab we do with 200 millimeters under normal loading, but I would have thought that in this case it would have been about 300, 350 millimeters minimum, and in those are pre-stress slab, you can pre-stress them as well. It's a very standard way of constructing there, and most of the uh, contractors know it very well. So it is apparent according to the mission, uh, and they can go about 16.8 meter spans with that. Highly optimized, um, and then uh, the, the deflection doesn't start to govern in most of the cases because it's a large section. Post tension? It can be uh, uh, normally post tension uh, beams. Uh, Concrete um, slabs are normally pre stressed most of the cases if they go. Post tensioning, um, yeah, it is mostly post tension because of the size of it and all that. Ah, yes, there was a question here. Yeah, sorry. Idealization, idealized sections, you mean? Yeah. Ah, oh, right. Okay, yeah, true. Okay, I, I got your point. Although uh, I have shown that entire structure model, which was a CAD, uh, uh, what we call the wireframe, uh, we can save it as a DXF file and then bring in the section which we only want to be analyzed in the, um, uh, using the structural analysis program. So it was not looked at over altogether. It looked at in isolation, of course. Although we have developed one single wire diagram because you can import it in quickly, you can delete most of the other elements, then you have the real geometry rather than generating that geometry one by one. So what we have done was geometry was established well and truly first, and then that provided as a sound database for individuals to take uh, uh, and then get an idealized section for an example those fish like uh, trusses uh, was designed exactly as you said I mean, you took the uh, truss in isolation and then uh, looked at the T2 being as a support and then one end as simply supported from the spandrel beam and then the other end was a cantilever and then just put the usual loads and then but also when you do a Evaluation. You have to have the whole structure in three-dimensional form, otherwise you can't do a uh, proper proper evaluation. So for that reason, in some cases, we needed 
this overall structural behavior. <coughs> At least the uh, stay sections, as I said, the east and west stayed roof together with the large trusses and the secondary trusses, as well as the north and south uh, segments. But at least the segment has to be looked at when it comes to the buckling analysis. Otherwise, you will not see the full picture. Dynamic analysis is always a three-dimensional analysis. Yeah. You, lump mass, you, lump, you provide lump masses for each node and then let the whole thing goes as a, um, how do I call it, um, half sack, where, where it's like a um, uh, membrane where, where you can really see the uh, different modes. And you can look at two about six modes, different modes, and then you can visualize the natural frequency falls anywhere near any one of those uh, natural frequencies. It's not only the fundamental frequency we will look at. We have to look at the mass participation and lots of other other things need to be done, looked at. Those very good questions. Um, yes, uh, you can do uh, trust by trust, of course. You can do secondary trusses by trust, but that will only give the half of the picture. In a structure like this, uh, let me, if you were to take away one single uh, message from me, the strain incompatibility, deflection and deformation plays a huge, huge role compared to the strength design. Strength design is never an issue. It is the uh, most important aspect is what we call the strain compatibility. Uh, Locking's residual stresses. These are, these are not normally taken into consideration in most of the uh, structures uh, do in day to day. But in this type of situation, for an example, when we have this large truss, put it into segments, spliced, brought in, pull it down with a hose, locked it in, even though that the roof and the wind forces are not acted upon it, already it is stressed. These are called the residual stresses, which locked in because of the construction method. You should not ignore that component. In some cases, it's really, really high. So there should be a way of counting for residual stresses which locked in place due to construction loads, which you can't take it out from it. Yes. That's okay. How do you manage to write such a Yes, yes, that's a measure, yeah, intensity, yes. Um, the, um, although I have not, I don't Go quickly, an original one. Oh, no. Um, if you look at one in, at night, uh, these trusses, as I said, this is this. This you see the uh, this is a night time, uh, day night match uh, in, in in progress. This must be footing. So you can see the inside. What's the lighting in relative terms? This could be around seven o'clock at night uh, on a, on a, on a, in today. So um, uh, although we we not see this, these trusses are so high that uh, it's about two four meters in most of the places, and then they. Uh, the T2 trusses the, uh, uh, was around 12 meters, as I said. So there are a lot of catwalks and uh, mountable profiles. People can walk through this roof for maintenance purposes, uh, taking photos, and for uh, media personnel. Uh, you can walk around this, uh, this stadium. Um, so I think I will probably in my, in one of the things I didn't pick it up. Okay. I, that's a good question. Can you see there's a little uh, there's a little red color thing there? That's a catwalk. A p this this height is about four meters. You know, height is two point one. Door door would be about two point one meters, right? So you can walk around this area so with, without any problem. It is four point eight here. Um, so it's a large access. <coughs> Yes.
is the time for vote of thanks. Before that, there's a engineer proposal will come and give a token of appreciation. <coughs> We had indoor stadium in Melbourne, engineering challenges and lessons learned. It's a very interesting topic we selected and uh, we invited Dr. Samandi Silva from Australia. So most of our engineers are here for, I think so, they are all related with structural engineering. So we got a lot of uh, information, normally in Sri Lanka. I hope that one. We are dealing with maximum 10 or 12 millimeter thickness section, steel section, but you deal with 58 millimeter, this and that one. So, the, this very interesting uh, lecture today we had. So, even though this uh, with time limitation, you delivered wonderful lecture today. So, on behalf of Civil Engineering Sectional Committee, we have, thank you for the valuable contribution and uh, as usual today we had reasonable audience here so thank you very much for your present here and also I have to thank our ESL <coughs> secretary to organize event successfully thank you